So, in this video, I'm going to be going over not really a traditional, typical review like you'd normally have of motorcycles, um, such as like specs and, you know, tire sizes and, you know, different things like that. Um, this bike I've had, uh, this is my first bike, it's 2018 Honda Shadow Aero VT 750 CS, which means that it is the ABS model. Um, there are actually not a lot of these that uh, were made uh, as far as the ABS model goes. I had to actually look for a few months to be able to locate this bike when I was um, in the market to get one. Uh, this is actually, I think, the only uh, shadow they make nowadays that actually has um, ABS on it. Although there are a lot of bikes that are slowly progressing toward um, that ABS kind of standard as far as uh, newer motorcycles being made especially with a lot of them going electric but anyway what I'm going to be doing is because this bike is actually coming up on close to 40,000 miles um, and I'll probably hit that around the beginning of this next year um, I've actually had this bike on a couple of long distance trips this year and uh, one of those was solo, one of those was riding two up. And just wanted to kind of share my thoughts for those that may be just getting into motorcycling or looking at the different options they have as far as maybe a beginning or mid-range motorcycle, as well as for those that may be re-entering after having not ridden for several years. So uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the, some of the things that have really stuck out to me over the time that I've had this bike and put all these miles on it because I, whenever I got it the miles was 0 .01 on the odometer so all of these are original to me and um, I'll touch on some of the uh, issues that I've had um, as far as these bikes go so uh, we're going to take a short ride and discuss the pros and cons I'll go over the pros first and if you uh, enjoy what you see or hear in this video and you found it helpful please like, share, or subscribe. I'd, I'd like to be able to put out uh, more quality content so I don't have a lot of videos out at the moment as opposed to just, you know, pushing content out just for the sake of producing content. Uh, I know that that's probably not the best YouTube model um, based on today's standards, but that's just kind of my style of doing things. So, let's go. This is actually uh, middle November in Northeast Texas right now. I wasn't exactly sure if I needed gloves or not. We'll just see. The fairing's kind of uh, blocking a lot of the wind right now, but we'll just see. And for any of you that do live around this area, one of the ways that I usually go as far as like enjoyable routes to drive um, kind of goes around I-30 you know that's kind of like the main route into uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area it goes kind of right into it and uh, of course <laughs> as usual there's like a wreck on there every single day so won't we'll be going that way today since that there was actually an accident on there causing major delays and then the second route that I would normally take as an alternate is also backed up because of the accident on 30. So we'll just see what can do. But thankfully there are a lot of uh, different routes 
have been able to locate and find. So, first of all, getting into, and it's a little windy today as well. I'll try to make sure I cut down on the wind noise as much as possible. So one of the things, first of all, about this bike, it's very, very user-friendly. Um, there are not a lot of distractions. Uh, by that, I mean, it is very simplistic. You got a speedometer, you've got your gauge lights on there, you've got an ABS light, engine oil, um, temperature neutral light, and that's pretty much it. You know, you got a couple of trip meters and the odometer, that's all digital. Um, but aside from that, it's really just the, uh, the lights that are up on the tree, that's for the fuel reserve. Since this is a model after 2009, uh, it's not carbureted, it is fuel injected. Um, and they've been fuel injected for a while, uh, with that being the case, you know, about nine years or so. And so it doesn't actually have a reserve, uh, reserve fuel switch. Um, instead, it just has a fuel sensor in the tank with a couple of uh, wires. Whenever it hits that point, then it will actually start to flash on. The fuel economy on this bike is actually really, really good. Um, the tank itself holds about 3.7 gallons, and about 0.9 of those uh, gallons is reserved. So it gets about 56 miles per gallon, ideally. Um, and I imagine that those numbers are probably just based off of the rider and the bike itself, not any kind of additional luggage, no additional passengers or anything like that. So uh, it gets it gets pretty good uh, fuel mileage. Typically, I'll refill it before the uh, uh, fuel gauge actually starts flashing at me. Or not the fuel gauge, but the uh, reserve light starts flashing at me. And I usually get about 158 miles. Um, before I'll uh, fill up. And of course, you know, a lot of that is based on, two how much uh, you top off your tank. So one of the things that I noticed early on is that I was getting kind of inconsistent fuel numbers. And after a while, I realized that um, there were uh, air pockets that were within the tank itself, which, you know, prior to that, just riding in a car, you don't think about, you know, fuel pockets. Um, preventing a tank from being completely filled up whenever you go to fill up, but that combined with the heat of the engine underneath the tank can sometimes do kind of do some funny things with your uh, your fuel range itself. Um, so it's, it's very user friendly, very few distractions um, to have to worry about. Um, also very few electrical components. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, obviously a lot more bikes nowadays, they have uh, digital display is the best word I can come up with. It, come up with a digital speedometer uh, has a tachometer. This the the arrows for the most part do not have um, a tachometer on it, so um, uh, you don't have to worry about that when shifting necessarily because it does have a rev limiter to kind of counteract that. Um, so it's it's very very simplistic that way. It's not really intimidating at all. This is not a uh, heavy bike as much as it would look like one. This is a 750, so 750cc's. And of course, you know, higher up you've got your uh, bigger uh, cruiser touring bikes that are like, you know, twice that and above. Um, they used to make an 1100 uh, aero. But um, I, I think maybe around in the early 2000s or so, they might have discontinued that model. Um, the only, I guess, cruiser-style bike that uh, Honda offers right now that's in that uh, higher class range without going to a touring bike like the Goldwing uh, would be the Fury. Because I think that's about the 1300 or 1800, one of the two, I can't remember. Um, but that was their more chopper style uh, bike that once again is just, uh, I think that's only a single uh, solo rider type bike, kind of like the Rebels. Um, so uh, it's very, very uh, low center of gravity, very low weight in the middle. 
um, has very good balance. For a beginner rider, uh, about the only thing I would say that was intimidating about this thing was just adjusting your expectations to how the bike actually handles and adapting to that because every bike is going to ride differently. Every bike is going to have a different, uh, you know, seating position, a different feel, a different reach for the bars. Motorcycles are truly a, you got to find the one that fits you the best. It's not like a, you know, a car where you can adjust the seating and stuff like that. Although you can, you know, it's very easy to replace and swap out handlebars on these shadows. Um, but it's like most everything on my bike is still stock. About the only things that I have uh, changed from stock are like the tires, the brake pads, the things that actually wear out and have to be replaced at regular service intervals. Okay, so secondly, throttle. It has a very forgiving throttle response. So what I mean by that, um, this, this bike itself will not get away from you if you're a new rider. Uh, most of the bikes that they will, you know, have you practice on at the MSF course, if you're in a state, here in Texas, it's required to take an MSF course. Um, and so, that to me was a great opportunity to be able to first see if I wanted to get into motorcycling at all. Um, if it was something that I wanted to invest the time and the effort and the money in, being the bike and, of course, all of the accessories and upgrades that you uh, naturally want to uh, add on once you've actually bought it and you kind of develop your taste of uh, what you want your riding experience to be and that's just part of the customization of this you know some might call it a hobby um, my uh, my bike is actually my main choice of transportation I love riding this thing I love being out I love how interactive and proactive it is riding a motorcycle. The things that you see that you never see in a car are just, it's eye-opening. Uh, especially during rush hour traffic around the Dallas area. So, <laughs> it's very, very interesting. But um, as opposed to a lot of bikes that have a uh, you know big, massive engine, which also adds to the overall weight, which can be a little cumbersome and difficult to get used to as a beginning rider. Um, this throttle is not very touchy at all. Um, it uh, won't get away from you if you do crank the throttle. Uh, it doesn't have a real fast response time, uh, response time off of the line. Um, so if you're sitting at a traffic stop, if you're you know going to pass a car or anything like that, you know you can't gun it and just zip past them. Um, at lower speeds, yes. At higher speeds, it's a little bit more uh, uh, difficult to be that quick. Um, now, with that, I will say it's actually very, uh, very good as far as its ability to keep up with traffic on highways or interstates where they're going like, you know, 75 miles an hour, which is the speed limit in most states. Um, of course, you know, most cars along there are going like, you know, 85, 90, even some semi-trucks. But, um, for <laughs> most legal purposes, this bike actually does very well keeping up on the interstate, even riding two up. Um, and I won't get into too much, uh, uh, two up comparisons, uh, in this video, since I actually do, um, have a separate, uh, one that I'll, I'll be doing that talks specifically two couples that you know may be wanting to take a trip but they're not sure if they can do it on this particular kind of bike um, 750 specifically so um, it's very forgiving on the throttle next thing I want to talk about which is one of the, the reasons why I was kind of drawn to this bike and a lot of other specific reviews that I saw the ABS feature on this bike now the ABS feature, they did not, they did not make many of those, um, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning of this video. They don't make very many of the ABS models uh, for whatever year they bring, they bring out the new, the new year models for. Um, 
I looked at a lot of my local dealerships, um, power sports places, Honda uh, dealers, all of those, and none of them seem to be able to locate this particular year model um, with the ABS. There were plenty of standard models around, and aside from just the ABS, there are a lot of uh, other differences, mainly aesthetically, um, on the uh, ABS model compared to the standard. The standard is what you're going to see in the standard is what you're going to see in most showrooms. Uh, you go in and you see a, a shadow sitting there. It's going to have the blacked out rims. It's going to have the blacked out engine. Um, it's going to have a front disc brake, a rear drum brake. Um, still has a chrome exhaust, which doesn't make a lot of sense given everything else that's blacked out on it. Um, and that, that'll be your standard, your standard model. The uh, ABS version is actually completely chromed out. Chrome pipes, uh, chrome engine, chrome uh, cylinder heads, uh, uh, chrome, uh, you know, really just everything is just chrome. Which, I mean, it looks very nice, very beautiful, but anybody who's had a bike that's fully chromed before knows it takes a lot to keep it clean. But, you know, after a few years, you get a system down of how it's most effective to go about cleaning that bike. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway, um, the ABS version does have, uh, it has a single rotor in the front and in the rear. Um, since it's not that large of a bike, not that heavy, I think it's about 550 pounds, then uh, they just put a single rotor on the front rear wheel. Um, in addition to that, you do have the, uh, the brake pads. Those are pretty easy to get to and uh, maintain. That's one of the things that I really do like about this because you do not have to take off the entire rear wheel like you do with a standard version to be able to swap out the brake pads on the rear wheel. So maintenance makes it a little bit easier that way as well. Um, just getting to the, the ABS feature itself, there are no telling, because I ride year-round. In a Texas here, we get every kind of weather except for, well, I would say snow and ice, but the last couple of years we've actually gotten that for maybe a week or so around in February. Uh, but, you know, this bike with my daily commuter, and I would ride it in the rain, I would ride it 30 mile an hour winds, and um, you know, temperatures 20, 30 degrees, and such like that, which is possible to do um, with the, with the uh, appropriate gear. But the ABS, no doubt, has saved me a lot of uh, problems uh, with the, the type of traffic that is around here, with the, the start and stop and everything like that. Hey! And, uh, is he letting me go by? I'm guessing that's what it is. All right. Um, man, it's funny today. Thank you. Uh, I didn't kind of see the acceleration there. It was from about like 45 about 65 which is what it is along here but everybody pays attention to the speed signs so uh, yeah the ABS will really benefit a lot of beginning riders that are getting used to um, having to use those skills that they teach the MSF course of how to brake and how to without having to suffer too terribly the consequences of dropping the bike or skidding and losing control of the, the traction under the back of the front wheels that way. Um, the ABS applies on the front and back brakes of this bike. Um, in the back, the, uh, the uh, rear brake is linked. So whenever I apply brakes to the back wheel, then it also applies it slightly to the front as well. Um, and there, you know, the, the one downside that I would say which I don't have this in my uh, cons list, but the one downside that I would say about uh, ABS, and this would be the same with any uh, four-wheel vehicle, is that it does prevent you from going into a skid, which is what it's meant to do. However, the only time that that is a, uh, an issue that I found is whenever you're going, if you're traveling a straight line 
car in front of you all of a sudden slams on their brakes. And in some cases where that typically happens is someone pulls right in front of them and it immediately puts their brakes on because there's not enough distance between them and the car ahead of them. So uh, in, in that instance, you know, the, you're not going to be able to, to slam on the brakes. You're not going to be able to skid to a stop, even if you're in a straight line, which would be the, the only time that you would want to do anything like that if you had to. I mean, they actually teach that as emergency braking in the MSF course. So, and those bikes do not uh, have ABS on them at all. So, the times that this would uh, be helpful is, you know, if you're having to brake on a curve all of a sudden, and uh, you can't, uh, you know, see immediately what traffic is going on, you know, around that turn that's completely blind. Um, same kind of thing in wet conditions, it does really, really well. And there are not, I don't think that there have been any times where I have actually uh, skidded with this bike, um, having to like really apply the brakes hard. The ABS does a beautiful job of slowing to a stop. Um, and it does, it does have a, uh, a very good response to it. But just know that you're not going to skid. This thing does not even allow you to skid. There is no way to be able to turn it off. It is a feature that is continually on um, on these uh, bikes. Okay, what are you doing? All right. You never know. Uh, another thing about these shadows. Um, the more current models that they have, with that being mainly the Shadow and the Phantom, you're going to have mostly shaft-driven transmissions, as opposed to chain or belt. If you've done any kind of research on chain or belt, then uh, you know the chain, the the uh, belts are probably the uh, least reliable. It's not to say they're not good; they're just the re least reliable. They're prone to uh, breaking. And chains can also break, but they will also stretch. Um, the shaft drive is the only one that is very consistent from one maintenance interval to the next. And unless you've just got a faulty shaft drive, you never really have to change that out. Um, so about the only kind of maintenance that has to be done on your shaft drive, really, is just switching out and replacing the transmission fluid or the, the final shaft, or the final drive fluid is what they uh, believe refer to it as. Okay. And see, there's a perfect example of the ABS in action. Um, no skid, no nothing. I applied both the front, back brakes, pulled the clutch in, and no skidding, no feel of loss of control or anything like that. It does a really great job. Um, but getting back to the shaft drive, uh, that's that's really all the, all the maintenance that needs to be done on that. Um, and as far as I know, if you've got the proper tools and things like that, it's you know it's it's simple to be able to change out the shaft drive uh, shaft drive fluid, the final drive fluid, um, and uh, you know remove the wheels, replace the tires, or anything like that if you got the proper equipment. Um, and since I usually take, uh, since that's usually done at um, regular maintenance intervals to begin with, and that's usually whenever I'll just have it done. Um, uh, same thing with the oil changes, although it's very easy to change the oil on these. Um, you just got the drain plug in the bottom, the oil filter, and the only problem I would say would be maybe the clearance, where it'd probably be easier to be able to uh, jack the bike up to be able to have a little bit more clearance for that to uh, drain. So another reason why these shadows have been around as long as they have been, because shadows, <laughs> it, it, and I even, before I became an owner of a Honda, and just I think Honda in general, just their engines are, Tata's being nearly indestructible. I mean, they are amazing engines. I have had no problems with this engine um, since I got the bike. 
uh, no, no difficulties. There may have been a gasket that needed to be replaced on the cylinder heads, um, but no major issues, no, uh, no big problems that had to be diagnosed or parts that had to be uh, replaced of great significance. This thing has been in all different kinds of temperatures, extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, rain, um, have taken, you know, hundreds of miles of long trips, uh, riding, you know, just solo and then riding two up, and the engine has maintained its consistency, its integrity, and it really has performed beautifully. It's a V-twin, so it's got a really great sound to it as well. Um, and the, the funny thing about it is a lot of a lot of the shadows, if you've ever met somebody that rides a shadow, um, their bike will get mistaken for a Harley-Davidson, I would probably say maybe about 80-90% of the time. And of course, you know, most of the time it's it, it's pretty humorous because it's not uh, it's not compared to that um, by people that uh, actually do ride. It's usually people that are just noticing it. Um, but I've met people that have ridden a shadow before, and they love looking at the the newer models because they may have ridden one that was like back in the '80s, um, the last time that they owned a shadow or even rode. Um, and so that, that's, that's saying something, not only to the model, but also to the brand, that it has that kind of a, a reputation of reliability and uh, just, just the, the joyfulness of operating a bike like that and the reliability of it as well. I mean, like I said, this was, you know, uh, my daily commuter for a year right up until the beginning of the pandemic and all the lockdowns and stuff. And uh, this bike got me there, you know, hour-long commute in the morning, hour-long commute in the evening. And that was really one of the highlights of my day. Uh, very reliable engine, great sounding engine. But people have uh, upgraded their exhaust and then put it back to stock because the upgraded exhaust was much too loud. Um, uh, Honda Shadow's exhaust does have a very good sound to it. Um, you know, it's it's not going to be anywhere near as loud as what most Harleys are, but you do get that V-twin sound, and it's it's really uh, you can check out some of my ASMR videos um, because that is just the sound of the bike and the ambient sounds around that. So you can get a really good idea of what the what the bike sounds like just as a as a stock exhaust and no modifications to the engine, air filter, or anything like that. Um, I've not done any of those. It's been kept the way that it was from the factory since the day that I got it. One of the other things that um, I would point out about this is that, especially whenever you get to working on your bike yourself, whenever you build up that, that level of confidence to, to want to become that much more familiar with the inner workings of your uh, motorcycle, whether it's just to be able to diagnose if there's an issue, whether it it may not start. You know, I recently uh, cleaned both of my uh, ignition switch and then also my turn signal switch because, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's not done in just regular maintenance. And so uh, with that being the case, then um, I had to, uh, you know, crack those things open. It's very easy, just a screwdriver, a few screws that had to be uh, taken out and then removing the the electrical contacts getting those things cleaned up and it feel, feels like new again it had like 40 like I said about 38,000 miles worth of uh, junk road debris all that kind of stuff um, up in those uh, up in those controllers it, it really needed to be cleaned out <laughs> so um, with uh, with most of these shadows uh, any kind of uh, group that you can join, even on Facebook, there's a group that I'm in on Facebook, the Haunted Shadow Riders. Um, it's it, you really do see that there are not a lot of changes that have been made to these bikes over the last couple of decades. Um, you know, most 750s will be able to accommodate parts across years. 
um, within that same model, you know, you got an arrow for an arrow, phantom for a phantom, uh, the same thing with the spirits or the aces, the American classic edition. Um, and so there's there's uh, a lot of uh, crossover just because there has not been that much of a change to the design of these. They may have updated the features like going from carbureted to um, you know fuel injected, but as far as you know anything past that goes, um, it is it they're they're very similar um, bolt sizes. Um, really any kind of so you know a lot of those groups they're you know frequently selling parts parting out a bike and you know a lot of times they don't necessarily have to be your specific um, I would say that they do have to be model specific though so anyway um, the uh, the shadows have really not changed all that much um, if anything they've really just kind of played around with the types of models that they come out with because like I said they don't make the 1100s anymore they used to have an 1100 Tourer which actually came with its own uh, color matched saddlebags really a beautiful bike I wish they would bring that one back um, you know with a lot of the more updated um, features um, but the uh, the spirits and the aces they don't make those anymore but surprisingly a lot of people that have you know gotten one of these bikes is like you know a uh, uh, first bike to them it's not you know obviously brand new because of the year that it came out but some of these bikes that are from the 80s and they are still running you know and I mean it's it, it's amazing to um, it's, it's amazing to see that <laughs> and especially know that a lot of the bikes that were made back then I mean you think of cars nowadays I mean my goodness most you know most people don't go be like five years or so without getting a new car and you still got you know uh, some of these older Honda Shadows that are still uh, running and being sold and bought and uh, such like that um, the only thing that I would say with older bikes is you, you run into the problem where they obviously don't make the parts for that anymore and then you have to either find a place that does have that part in stock still or you have to uh, fabricate it or find someone that can fabricate it but aside from that these these bikes have not really changed all that much so a couple more things and then we'll move on to the cons um, as I said before this bike is very uh, very light compared to a lot of the uh, the baggers that you might see a lot of the heavier uh, larger CC engine bikes um, because typically once you get into a bagger class, it's usually like from 1800, you know, from 1300 maybe and up to 1800. Um, this bike, I believe, is about 550 pounds um, whenever it is topped off on all of its fu uh, fluids and um, has a full gas tank. So that's about 3.7 gallons um, of fuel that it holds. And... The, you know that that may sound like a lot of weight to have to deal with but honestly whenever you're riding at speed it is no problem whatsoever really a lot of the weight because of the balance of this bike um, you know it's got a it's got a two into two exhaust and the exhaust comes out on on both you know the right side um, but honestly even at a standstill at a light that you can feel how low the weight is uh, just whenever you're standing there um, at a stop so the weight on this bike is is very uh, very manageable um, and you know there are jokes <clears throat> about how you know most most Harley Sportsters are female riders because it's uh, it's a lower it's a smaller bike and stuff like that well, the Shadow is one of those that's kind of preferred and recommended for a lot of female riders as well um, and I, I don't think it's necessarily because of the weight, but I, I think a lot of it mainly has to do with the low seat height. Um, now I do have an upgraded uh, saddle. I've got the uh, the Mustang wide touring saddle on this. Seriously, it's like sitting on a recliner chair. 
whenever you're riding. You can do hours on this saddle. It's an amazing seat. I love it. But um, the bike does have a very low seat height. I think it's about 25, 26 inches, something like that. So, I mean, it's 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 good for short riders. Um, taller riders, like about, up around, you know, six feet or so, you know, they can uh, manage riding it uh, pretty easily as well. Um, uh, and I, I do know that there are some that have actually got like forward control extenders um, If in fact they are not tall enough to be able or the, they're not tall enough or t the the controls are not far forward enough to be able to uh, Make it a comfortable enough ride for them. If that makes sense Through a lot of words out there but um, It's it's a very uh, manageable weight don't really notice it all that much so it's not something that you're going to be intimidated by for very long um, initially whenever you're just getting used to you know switching gears and chewing gum at the same time uh, that will be mainly when you realize a lot of the uh, intricacies of the bike that way um, and to be quite honest, I think this is my turn, huh? <laughs> I'm doing this route by memory. Um, and during that early progression, especially if you're new, if you're a new or beginning rider, then you're going to be very knowledgeable about the weight. Um, until you get comfortable enough with how it handles, you become familiar with um, the way that it uh, works with you know, going uphill, going downhill, going into curves, being able to throw that weight around and use it to your advantage um, to get the most, the most out of that weight management. And then lastly, this bike is one of the very few that is liquid cooled. Um, there are so many bikes that are uh, air cooled and riding in Texas during the summertime I'm very thankful that this bike is liquid cooled because it removes a great deal of heat um, that I don't that I would uh, probably otherwise feel uh, if it were just an air cooled engine. Um, I've not had any problems with the uh, the radiator or the uh, engine light coming on on this bike. Um, whenever it gets really hot in the summer and it's been running for you know a while, if I just kind of uh, you know pull up into a parking lot somewhere, check direction, something like that for an extended period of time with the bike on, then I'll hear the fan kick on. But that's about that's really about all that um, all that I really noticed as far as. Uh, any uh, any uh, noise or any kind of tension coming from the, the radiator. Of course, the radiator is right below the gas tank at the very front of the bike, um, so it uh, it actually is a, a, a typical uh, liquid cooled engine. It runs the fluid throughout the whole cylinder um, casing uh, to remove a lot of the heat from that engine, as opposed to just you know, I think some of the Harley Davidsons have. Uh, uh, oil cool um, engines where it actually kind of removes the heat that way um, but the, the heat management on this bike is really amazing it's not going to cook you like um, what some of the uh, the Indian bikes do before they added the rear cylinder deactivation because um, once again those are those are all uh, you know air cooled uh, where if you're not moving then that heat is not going anywhere except for up into the rider. So, um, very good heat management. Now, on to the cons. So, one of the things that I mentioned was that it is very simple. It has no distractions to it. Um, one of the cons of this is that it, it does not have a gas gauge to it. Um, so that means that uh, whenever you're trying to determine how much fuel you've got left in your tank, you can either pop the cap or you can look at your trip meter. That is what a lot of people that have bought shadows and realize, oh, there's no gas gauge to it. 
um, it, uh, it's, it's really just the trip meter. They don't make any kind of aftermarket uh, gas gauges that are very reliable. And honestly, ever since I started riding this thing back in 2018, then the trip meter has been my main uh, main source for keeping track of fuel uh, fuel range or anything like that. And like I said, it, it, it carries quite a bit of fuel. Um, and I believe based on the numbers, if you're going by that, um, and it will vary per rider, per their weight, and the type of roads that they're on, and uh, things like that. But I get about 158 miles before it actually goes to reserve. That's on a 3.7 tank with 0.9 of that in reserve. Gets about 56 miles per gallon. And so even at 0.9, that's about 50 miles left that you can go once it hits reserve. If that's about the kind of range that you're seeing. Um, and you know, it's and, and once again, this is based off of stock fuel management, stock exhaust. Uh, it has not been tuned or anything like that for aftermarket uh, engine performance parts or anything like that. So, you know, just doing the math on that, if I'm getting about 158 uh, regularly before the fuel sensor comes on, and then I've got another 0.9 once it does kick into the reserve, and that 0.9 is equal to about 50 more miles, then I can get about I would say on a low end about 200 miles out of one tank if I'm you know looking to push it to the limit so um, for me personally I have not found that the lack of gas gauge has been that big of an issue uh, riding this bike um, and just using the uh, the trip meter um, now the one thing that I will say is that you know anytime that you uh, uh, take it in for service or they have to unhook or remove the battery that does reset your trip meter so then you know depending on if you remember what your mileage was before the uh, battery was disconnected and unhooked and such then you might need to make a uh, trip to the gas station so another con about this that a lot of people have pointed out and I will say that riding two up um, is, uh, I guess, somewhat of an annoyance, though not really a hindrance. Is just it's it, you know going along with it being very forgiving on the throttle. It is not very fast on acceleration. There is very short intervals between the first, second, third gear um, on this bike to get up to what is normally your standard, you know, road speeds of 45 miles up to 60 depending on what kind of roads you're driving on. Through here, you know, we're going between 40 to 45 just because there are so many uh, turns and curves in the road. And then, of course, we've got a lot of, you know, cars in front of us, too, that are kind of dictating what the, uh, the speed is. Whereas, if this is an empty road, I would be able to duck into these corners, you know, outside, inside, outside, have very smooth uh, throttling transitions and really use uh, the, the landscape of the road for um, you know the most benefit possible out of the acceleration not having to continually adjust my speed and everything like that um, the the bike itself I mean it, it does do very well accelerating between uh, the lower gears it's just you have to shift very quickly to actually get that speed because it's not a wide range I mean you've only got about 10 miles range between those so just depending on the situation it, in some cases it might be nicer for it to have a quicker thought uh, throttle response but you know you've been watching through this video um, you know I've been going through uh, rural areas through city uh, intersections and stuff like that um, you know, I've not really found that to be that big of an issue or a problem having ridden this bike as many miles as I have. And part of that just goes back to the, um, the, the fact of uh, it's a shaft drive as well. So with, you know, most shaft drives, that is where you're going to have most of your power loss. But what you gain in the ease of maintenance and such like that, that's what you end up uh, kind of sacrificing in terms of the 
power that it delivers to the bike overall. Another con is the stock saddle. And this is not something that is specific to shadow bikes um, specifically because there are a lot of motorcycles out there. It's like, you know, the one, the one thing that a lot of manufacturers should really focus on to keep their customers wanting to ride all the time is just the comfort of the ride itself. And whenever they get to the saddle, it's kind of like, uh, as I uh, usually say a lot in uh, working on my bikes and stuff, that should be good. They had a that should be good moment whenever it came to the quality of the saddle. Now the saddle is not terrible to sit on and to ride, but after about an hour or so, um, the, the foam really has a ton of give to it. So it breaks down very quickly from the time that you start riding. I would say that even for me, and I'm about 5'10", I'm about, I would say, average height. Um, and I, I can go for about an hour before I start noticing like discomfort, specifically in my, uh, in my left leg um, on that side. And I, and I do know that it can come from like however you're shifting in the saddle or whatever side of the saddle you kind of uh, favor more if you're not like sitting, you know, centered on it that is that is one thing that i would say definitely um it it took me about maybe a year or so to uh, work up to be able to upgrade to a saddle because of the same token a lot of these aftermarket saddles though they are incredibly comfortable they are also incredibly expensive um the two saddles that i heard about the most were corbin um which seem to deal a lot more in like uh uh, the single piece type saddles um, and then Mustang and Mustang seemed to be the one that won out in a lot of discussions that I uh, read from people that have upgraded their saddles so I really did um, make sure and do my homework look at a lot of reviews uh, make sure that they not only had one that would fit my model of bike um, of course, the ABS and the standard versions, they're, they're pretty much um, interchangeable that way. But uh, checking all of that and uh, I've, I've been incredibly happy with it. I've taken it on a couple long trips, as I said, and the, the seat does not uh, give way. It maintains its integrity, the consistency of just the riding experience, and so I would definitely recommend um, uh, a Mustang saddle if you're going to upgrade from stock. Because the stock one, after a while, you're, you become more distracted by the uh, discomfort from the stock saddle than uh, you did before so just a couple more things first of all um, there is no tachometer on this bike so you don't really know for sure um, as a beginning rider if you have never and I, I will say I'm also coming from never having worked um, uh, a manual transmission on a car or otherwise um, this is my first manual transmission. Uh, to be quite honest, I found it very, very easy to uh, navigate. Um, now, like I said, there is no tachometer here, so you don't really have any kind of indicator of when to change gears. But, it does have a rev limiter on it. So, there's no risk of you, you know, redlining and blowing up the engine. Um... And after time, I actually realized you get to recognize the sounds that your bike makes, both the good and the bad when those do occur. But as far as uh, being able to determine which gear to shift to when, uh, in the owner's manual, they do give a suggested range. So from like 1 to um, 10, you got about first gear, from 10 to 20, about, you know, second gear or something like that and on and on until you get to about 55 miles an hour or 65 60 55 to 60 and then it goes into fifth gear and that is all the way up to sometimes 95 miles an hour 
Dallas traffic. Overall, being able to kind of recognize that, and then you, whenever you're giving it throttle and the bike's not going any faster, it's time to change it up to another gear. Now, this only has five gears to it, and some people have, you know, commented, especially if they're coming, you know, if they're an older rider and they're kind of getting rid of the, the bigger, you know, heavier uh, touring bike or something like that, they'll comment that they, they miss that sixth gear that they had on that bike. Um, but then at the same time, it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal breaker for them. It's just, you know, being able to have more of a rest in between uh, having to shift either upshift or downshift, um, that kind of thing. So there's that. Now, the other thing too, um, lastly, some people have uh, mentioned, you know, especially whenever they've been running for a while or they're running at uh, really high RPMs on the interstate, for instance, um, they'll notice that there's quite a bit of uh, vibration to the bike. Now, a lot of that, I would say, is just keeping in mind that there is, you know, a certain amount of power output by a 750cc engine. Um, especially whenever you're talking about going at those interstate speeds. The sweet spot for cruising on this bike um, is about, I would say, the 60 to 75 mile an hour range. You, I think probably between 60 and, or 50 and 65 around there. Um, it gets a nice hum to the engine. It's very consistent whenever you level off that acceleration and you're just cruising especially on those blacktop highways that just, you know, they're two lane divided. It re really has a nice um, long stretch to them and you can just sit back and enjoy the ride and the scenery and the sound of the engine. At higher speeds, and I do notice especially uh, on one of the trips that I took, I was going through Oklahoma and oh my goodness, because I was fighting that wind the entire time. That is whenever I did realize that there was um, some more vibration than usual um, that I felt. And I do think that a lot of that was just the engine trying to combat the drag. Because I was also riding with um, this uh, Batwing fairing that I've got on here. And the, uh, the uh, interstate speeds were about 75 that I was riding at, between 75 and 80. Um, going up through Oklahoma and that's whenever I did realize a lot of uh, vibration especially down toward you know the lower part like uh, the crash bars and stuff like that that I've got on here um, but I did um, install these uh, their foam uh, foam grip uh, slip-ons and that really did help to dampen a lot of the vibration especially in the just the handlebars themselves which you know after riding for um, a few hours that can really uh, that can really kind of do a number on your on your hands. Visors fogging up. <laughs> so um, honestly, that's really most of the cons that I could think of. And like I said, a lot of them were not really deal breakers. Um, they may be a slight nuisance, but as far as you know, ruining the rider, making it, you know, to that point where it's unenjoyable. I really didn't get get to that point. Um, so throughout all the thousands of miles that I put on this, um, it really has performed beautifully. No major mechanical problems or malfunctions with it. Um, I have had some battery issues. Uh, where the batteries have just been completely faulty from the factory. Um, terminals completely broke off uh, whenever I tried to get it out to change it. Um, but, you know, that's that's not really any kind of fault of the bike or anything like that. That's just um, poor quality control, I would say, on the battery manufacturer's part. But aside from that, no major issues. It's a great bike. I would definitely recommend it. Or uh, beginning riders or anybody that is coming back to uh, motorcycle riding after you know being away from it for a few years um, it does great as far as a uh, bike that will uh, kind of work with you as you gain and grow your skill and will not be too much for you to handle 
and give you something to be able to grow into and use for you know interstate riding as well as just going around town without you know having to deal with too much weight or having to deal with too much heat as you're driving it or riding it um, and so those are those are my thoughts um, after you know almost having uh, 40,000 miles put on this bike uh, if you have any comments, suggestions, or thoughts, um, you know, please please put them in the comments. I'd, I'd love to hear from other uh, riders that have either uh, ridden, you know, shadows before, um, or that may be interested in uh, these, uh, you know, this particular uh, motorcycle itself and have further questions about it. So until next time. Keep your shiny side up.